That was the best introduction I've ever had. <laughs> and I'm going to do my best here to live up to that. Uh, so I'm Danny, and this is Katrina, and we're super excited to tell you about Crane, uh, some of the deploy tooling we've built at Shopify. So to give you a quick overview of the talk, when I get out this way, there it goes. Okay. To give you a quick overview of the talk, uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about what Crane is and how it came to be. Uh, after that, we'll show you how it works. We're going to do some live demos that will exercise its real functionality. From there, we'll take a look inside of the guts of it and actually look at the code. And our goal here is to help you get a better mental model of what's going on. And since we're open source, if you ever want to contribute, uh, you'll have a leg up in getting started. And then finally, we'll talk about some lessons learned. This project is over three years old now. Uh, we've had internal contributors at Shopify. We've had external contributors in the community. And we integrate with Kubernetes. And we've done some things really well, and we've made some mistakes along the way. And we're hoping to share those so that all of you can well, learn from our experiences. So to kick it off, here's Katrina. So what exactly is Crane? Fundamentally, Crane is an open source deploy tool that we built specifically for Kubernetes. It's a tool that we use a lot at Shopify. Our metrics show that on a normal business day, we invoke Crane over 2,000 times. Things haven't always been this way, of course. Crane's story starts back in early 2016, when Shopify started investigating the possibility of running our apps on Kubernetes. After extensive experimentation, we decided to move forward with an internal platform as a service that would run all of our applications, from the smallest experiments right through to our business critical Rails monolith. We wanted our new platform to be self-service, so one of the things that we had to work out was how to enable our developers to deploy to it themselves. Maybe the most obvious thing to do is to give developers a tool that simply runs kubectl apply for them, right? In our first iteration, that's exactly what we did. And of course, it worked beautifully for initiating changes. However, kubectl apply's success is more the equivalent of, OK, I'll try, than the equivalent of, your changes worked. So all the success status really means is that the API server accepted your desired state, not that your desired state has been or will ever be reached. We knew that once we started onboarding non-experts, this was not going to cut it. What we wanted was a deploy tool that would empower our developers to deploy confidently to Kubernetes' eventually convergent system. This tool could not assume any Kubernetes expertise, and it had to give our developers the information they would need to recognize and solve problems independently. At the time, we didn't find any tools that were trying to do this. Notably, kubectl rollout itself didn't even exist, and although Helm was already getting popular, the feedback that it was giving at the time wasn't much more than you got from kubectl apply. So we decided to build Crane and make this our mission. We wrote Crane in Ruby, and at first, it was actually just a little script inside our higher level deploy tool, which is called Shipit. Incidentally, Shipit is also open source, so you can check that out if you're interested. As our script grew, we realized that it had independent value, and we extracted it to a Ruby gem with its own CLI. Originally, that gem was named after literally the file that it had been called in our in other deploy tool, so it had the uninventive name of Kubernetes deploy. This month, we were super excited to announce version 1.0, and we uh, have our new name with version 1.0, that's Crane. This was all thanks to the efforts of our 50 contributors, not all of whom work for Shopify, by the way. Um, and at Shopify, we've been using it in production since early 2017. We're hoping that uh, someone here today might feel inspired to join us next and become one of our contributors. So this here is what a, the most basic invocation of Crane looks like. You have Crane deploy, the name of your namespace, the name of the context that namespace is in, and then the list of files or directories that contain the set of resources that you want to have in that namespace. Already this tells you something important about the model that we chose for Crane. Fundamentally, we're managing a namespace for you. This means we're going to add, update, and remove resources to make the live state match the set of resources that you gave us. If you're thinking, that sounds a lot like you control apply with pruning enabled, you would be exactly right. We're doing exactly that under the hood, but that's not all we're doing. As I mentioned, our focus is on developer experience, and we lay the foundations for that by translating what's happening in Kubernetes into an accurate pass-fail result. This means that we do not declare success until the desired state has actually been achieved, and conversely, we try to detect when convergence is doomed as quickly as possible to give developers the chance to act on it. When we give developers that result, especially if it's a failure result, 
we want to make sure that they can take action and fix things. So, for example, if the problem is with a pod, we're going to show them a sample of its logs and events. We also do a lot behind the scenes to make deploys go more smoothly. For example, we do some deploy sequencing. One example of that is that we validate everything before we even attempt to deploy, which is a good idea, right? And we also sequence some resources before others. For example, it can be very important to deploy things like a quota before the things that that quota is supposed to constrain. Another great feature that we offer is the ability to run tasks like asset uploads or database migrations at the beginning of your deploy. The best way to appreciate these features is probably to see them in action. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Danny to give us some demos. So I know I promised you live demos, but I'll be honest, I'm not that brave. Uh, these demos were live when I recorded them, but well, that's stretching the word live, isn't it? So uh, the first demo is really straightforward. We're going to deploy a basic web app, something we do a lot at Shopify. Uh, the demo, sorry, the deploy has four phases. We begin by validation. After that, um, we're actually going to check the initial state of the cluster, make sure we know where we came from. Uh, we'll actually do the deploy, the thing we said we're going to do, and then we'll use some smart rollout logic to monitor what's going on and to be able to assert confidently that this was success or failure. Uh, the demo's going to go quick, uh, so don't worry about that if you don't catch it all in the first glimpse. I promise I'll break it apart after it runs. So let's do it. So we begin with the command we saw earlier, uh, crane deploy, test app, test cluster, and the resources. From there, we validate it, check the cluster state, we actually do the deploy, and now we're waiting for it to verify. Bang, success. That's exactly what we wanted to see. OK, so now as promised, we're breaking it apart. So in the beginning, we promise validation. So we start by validating the command line flags you've arguments you've passed, right? Does this cluster exist? Does the namespace exist in the cluster? How about those resources? Are they valid YAML? Are they valid Kubernetes YAML? Let's make sure. By the way, when I said simple web app, this is about as simple as I could come up with a deployment, a service, and an ingress. So let me check for their existence. Uh, now, this is the first time we deployed it, so they're not found. This is not particularly helpful. You're all sitting here like, yeah, of course it's not there, Danny. It's the first deployment. But where this becomes really powerful is later on when things go wrong. You can say, huh, it's crashing. Was it crashing before? Or why isn't that resource there? What's going on? So this is a nice historical step. After that, we actually do the deploy. Uh, so by default, we'll deploy all resources with kubectl apply, but we can use other verbs per resource kind. So if there's a bug or some other issue, we can create, we can replace, we can force replace if, if we need to. And then finally, the thing I think we're most proud of is the smart rollout logic. So we first you know, check to make sure that kubectl apply succeeded. But after that, we need to make sure that other resources were successful. Uh, so for a deployment, let's make sure the number of replicas you asked for are the number that are updated and available. For a service, if you're using pod selectors, let's make sure those pod selectors actually select something. Right? It's no good to say the ingress is fine, the deployment's fine, but oh yeah, your service, that's connected to nothing out there. Right? Like, we want the whole pipeline to work. But this is a super simple demo. Right, and things get more complicated as your apps get bigger. Say I want some dynamic configuration with a config map. Uh, so in this demo, we'll see the same things we saw before, but there'll be a new step. This is the priority resource deployment step where we actually get more deploy sequencing. So again, this will run pretty quickly. Oh, I should actually show you the config map. Basic config map, nothing too crazy here. Like I said, we'll kick this off, it'll run pretty quick. So, do the validation, and the validation failed? How did I fail a pre-recorded demo? Am I crazy? Well, OK, so it failed. Uh, there's a new resource uh, result here, right? Failure, that's new. I guess I'll take this opportunity to tell you what we do on failures. So first, we uh, give you some helpful error messages from kubectl apply, like data isn't a field in config map. Oh, shit. Oh. Uh, there's a typo in there. I'll fix that in a second. The other thing we do is actually give you the template. Now, in this demo, giving you the template is silly, right? There's one config map and one directory. I know where to find it. But if you use this as part of a larger pipeline where you render your resources dynamically or dynamically determine what you're going to render or, and generate, well, actually seeing the final thing here is a lot better than having to sort of piece it together historically. OK, so fix the typo. Promise that won't happen again. Let's kick off the deploy. OK, we got through validation this time. Got through the priority resource, so it went out. And now we're just validating that everything else is happy. Cool. Success. Whew. Be really embarrassing to do that twice, wouldn't it? OK, so breaking this apart, uh, here we're going to validate what's in the cluster. And the config map's not found, right? We failed validation. We didn't try and get it there. 
So historically, it's not there. The other piece is the priority deploy phase. So config maps go out is one example. Um, other consumables are things like service accounts or secrets. And for config maps, this is really important. Um, what you don't want to do is put a deployment out there and then have some of its pods start up and use the old config map, then put up a new config map and have the other half of the pods use the new config map, right? The sequencing guarantees that all of your pods in deployment will reference uh, the correct config map. For other things that I'm going to call state modifiers, RBAC, network policies, resource quotas, right, there's the same result you expect. If your resource quota says 10 pods and your deployment says 1,000, sensibly you want 10 pods. If you do these in the wrong order, you're not going to get what you want. And then finally, a class of things we'll call tasks. And we represent these as bare pods. Um, and if you use a Rails app or any sort of web app, you often know that before you start serving uh, websites, you want to get your static assets uploaded to a CDN, your JavaScript, your CSS, and images. So we use a pod to do asset uploading. This gets phased before we actually start serving anything, and it's perfect for us. Um, you can also stick other tasks in here, uh, whatever your heart desires. OK, but this config map was super contrived, right? Like, this doesn't really bias any, anything, so let's kill it. And we do that. The party resource phase is going to go away. But we'll get to see something new, pruning. OK, one more demo real quick. So type the command, do the validation, check the state, do the deploy, have it succeed. Bang. Easy. OK, so what's new here is the pruning, like we said. As soon as we deleted the config map and deployed, it got pruned from the namespace. And as promised, we manage your namespace. We keep everything in sync. But I keep talking about deploy commands, but if you remember the title slide of the talk, it was crane, not crane deploy. And the reason for that is we're not one command. We're actually five. Uh, so we've seen deploy a lot. We have a similar command called global deploy to help you manage the global namespace or non-namespace resources. We have restart. It's super great when deployments do rolling updates, right, this smooth, continuous availability. But sometimes you don't want to have to deploy. You just want to restart things. So we've added that functionality. We have crane run. In the same way that there are a lot of tasks associated with deploys you want to do, sometimes you have tasks that are outside of deploys. Uh, if you know Rails, these would be things like rake tasks. I'm pretty sure PHP has something equivalent in probably every framework. Uh, and then finally, a render task. Um, so some historic information. We used to dynamically render ERB as part of the deploy. And this meant that you didn't know what you were deploying until you actually deployed it sometimes. And that also meant that you couldn't check your templates in CI because they weren't YAML. They were, you know, Ruby's ERB language. So by breaking the renderer out into its own command, that let us have a continuous uh, integration that could also verify sensible things about your templates. So let's see another command. Uh, maybe restart this time. It looks a little different. We don't actually have to say what we want to restart. We'll dynamically find it. We'll do the restart, and then we'll continue to use our smart uh, logic to make sure it successfully goes out. So this one also goes by pretty quick. I promise I'll break it apart. So bang, type the command, have it find what you want, have it do the restart, smart logic goes, and then we get red text. Uh, red text gives me a bad feeling. OK, let's see where this goes. Yep, it didn't succeed. So the first thing is we have a new result status, timed out. So we saw success, we saw failure. Timed out is something in the middle, right? Kubernetes is eventually convergent, so maybe a timed out status will converge to success, or maybe it'll never get to failure, maybe it'll sit here forever. But if you're familiar with a progress deadline seconds for deployments, you use this idea that like, at some point you've got to make a decision and just decide it's not right. So I cranked this way down so we weren't going to be sitting here forever, like three seconds. In reality, right, like, I don't think anyone's ever set their PDS to three. But again, I don't want to keep us here for three minutes if you stare at a screen. Um, and so we failed. So let's actually see what other information we might be able to determine. Well, yeah, busy box, bad tag. I wonder why I can't pull that image. Uh, so that's one of the things we'll do. We'll pull all the relevant events. We also grab logs from your container. Uh, so if you're not familiar with Rails, this is basically the start of a stack trace. And basically, it means this pod's crashing on startup. Now, uh, this demo is super contrived, right? I think most of you have figured out, like, how did he get to this state, right? It was working the last deploy. And so in between here, I screwed some things up in the system. And if you were a developer, you would have had a failed deploy. But I suspect, as a developer, you've never, ever deployed something, had it failed, and said, maybe a restart will fix it? I'll try that, right? That, no one ever did that. The other thing to highlight here, and why this is a little bit contrived, is that we have fast failure detection. Uh, we expect developers to build images before they deploy them. So if we ever actually discover this event, uh, you know, can't find an image tag, we just immediately fail their deploy. Now, we don't 
okay, immediately fail it. We take more than three seconds to do it, but if I had set a reasonable PDS, we'd see failure here, but then I couldn't highlight timed out conditions without having you waiting forever. So, oh yeah. So on a happier note though, one other thing to talk about is the dynamic discovery, and hopefully that's not off the top of the slide. Um, when you restart, we could restart everything in your namespace, right? And then you remember that you might have a Redis in your namespace, and you might have a MySQL pod in your namespace, and you think, yeah, I don't want to restart those. So we actually use annotations to let you describe what you want to restart when you're restarting your app. Okay, this gets more and more contrived. I keep having to like walk back and back what I said at the beginning. The other thing that's contrived about this is I did it from my laptop, but this is part of our CD tooling, right? It turns out that you can run Crane from a laptop, but we don't. Uh, we give you access to the Ruby library, so you can do that. But of our 2,000 deploys a day, I think they're all done through our CD pipeline. So I want to show you what that looks like for a realistic, holistic view of how Crane is used. Uh, so this is ShipIt. Uh, this is specifically the restart page for one of our real apps. Well, it's a test app, but it's a real app. Uh, the page tells them, the user, the developer, what we're going to do, the command that's going to get run, and gives them a really nice button. People love buttons, right? So when they push the button, uh, they'll come to a page like this. Uh, it looks like an interactive terminal, but it's not. We're just doing the same logging we've seen before on a black background this time. Uh, but it allows the developer to see what's happened and to send links to other people saying like, hey, I'm well, in the success case, they don't have to send a link, but in the failure case, they can send a link to someone else to evaluate what's going on. So to peek behind the scenes, here's Katrina. So now that you know what Crane can do, as promised, we would like to give you a bit more insight into how we're doing that. Uh, and this will also help give anyone interested in contributing a foothold in our code. What I'm going to do first is go over some of the key classes that are involved in a deploy. The main one is called deploy task, and its main method is called run. And if you were to use Crane directly as a gem, this is what you would be calling. Deploy task is responsible for that sequence of phases that you saw in the demos, and it does this by coordinating other more specialized objects, such as resource deployer. Resource deployer basically adds some smarts around cube control commands. Another important class is called resource watcher. And this one is responsible for de determining when the deploy is actually done. And finally, at the heart of Crane, we have Kubernetes resource classes. Kubernetes resource is actually a superclass, and we implement subclasses of it for all the different resource kinds. These classes are what implements the, that smart kind-specific logic that lets Crane determine when each resource instance has reached a state that we consider terminal. In other words, succeeded, failed, or timed out. These last two, the uh, watcher and the resource classes, are particularly important to understanding Crane's approach, so I'm going to dive a bit deeper into those ones. So first we have the watcher. This is a slightly simplified but still very realistic representation of its main method, which is called run. As you can see, this is just a giant while loop. What we're doing here is polling. The most important part of the work happens in the middle method there, sync resources, and that's where we're talking to the API server, and I'm going to get back to that in a minute. After we talk to the API server, we tell the user about what we just saw. So did any resources just complete? Did they just succeed, fail, or time out? And what are we still waiting for? We let them know about that as well. Finally, we keep looping, and then once there's nothing left to watch, or when we hit the global timeout, which is something that you can configure, we exit. As I mentioned, uh, sync resources is the main, most important thing here, and resource syncing is a really key concept for us to understand. Inside the sync resource method, we're going to give each resource instance, so that's an instance of that Kubernetes resource class or subclasses, um, the, the, that set represents all the resources that you want in your namespace or the subset that we're still watching. We're going to give each one a chance to gather information from the Kubernetes API server. Otherwise, it doesn't have any access to that API server. And there are two reasons that we so strictly control when these API calls are made. The first one is perhaps the most obvious. We're doing it for performance reasons. If you're fetching hundreds of resources or even thousands from a large cluster, this can be very expensive, so you really don't want to make any more calls than you have to. The second reason is maybe less obvious, but it's also very important. We're doing this because it makes our determinations consistent. With Kubernetes, as you know, it, it's impossible to make a determination that's going to be valid indefinitely, because Kubernetes behind the scenes is trying to converge basically forever, and there are many processes in play that can cause the state to change over time. So what we're actually trying to do here is create an accurate snapshot representing a specific point in time. So that's what we're really doing during the sync. We're taking that snapshot. So as I was uh, suggesting, the way that we are taking a snapshot is by delegating to instances of the Kubernetes resource class. 
the watcher is going to call the sync method on each one of those, and it's going to pass in an object that has read-only API access and handles caching. The instance is then going to use that object to get whatever information it needs from the API server without ever causing us to repeat an API call within a sync cycle. After the sync is complete, the watcher is going to call these deploy failed, deploy succeeded, and deploy timed out methods on the resource instances to see if a determination has been reached for that instance. So here's a real example of one of the Kubernetes resource classes. This is actually the entirety of the config map class. Configuration objects are the simplest ones to implement because success for them just means that they were accepted by the API server and they're available for consumption. So you can see here that the deploy succeeded for a config map is just confirming that last time we looked, yes, this actually existed. And you can also notice that deploy failed. We don't have any known deploy failure uh, states for this kind. This next example isn't a real class, but it's representative of how the more complex logic uh, looks in, in the more complex resource classes. So essentially, the sync method is taking a snapshot of the live state of that resource. And then when we later call deploy succeeded and deploy failed, we're using that cache data to inspect the state and determine whether it matches our predefined expectations regarding success and failure. So if you're interested in contributing to Crane, these resource classes are a really great way to get started. We've implemented many kinds over the years, but there are still many left to do. In particular, we only recently added support for non-namespace resources via our new global deploy task, so we could definitely use help using uh, modeling more of those. Another way that you can help is contributing your expertise on failure modes that you've seen in the wild to help improve our fast failure logic. In other words, that's augmenting those deploy failed methods. If you're less familiar with Ruby or Kubernetes, we can always use help with documentation, and of course, we always appreciate receiving bug reports. If you have another idea, please open an issue and let us know. Now that you know what Crane is and how it works, as promised, we want to share some lessons that we've learned as we built it. So let's dive right into the hard part for me. These are some things that I would do differently if I started this project again, some mistakes. The first lesson learned is about being opinionated about your mission. As uh, Danny alerted, alluded to this earlier, but um, as you know, our mission is deploys, not template management. But when we started, our developers needed a way to inject the latest image tag into their deployments. And we decided to solve that problem by integrating a renderer right into our deploy command. We defaulted to using a template language that would be very familiar to our developers, ERB. ERB is essentially Ruby, and that means there's hardly anything it can't do. Naturally, over time, our developers took full advantage of this, adding loops, conditionals, and dare I say, API calls right into their templates. And what we've experienced is that, as templates become increasingly complex, leaving rendering to deploy time becomes increasingly dangerous. My recommendation is that if you use ERB or any other complex templating to do something non-trivial, you commit the result ahead of time, or at the very least, render and validate your templates in CI. There's nothing wrong with our renderer, but in Crane 1.0, we separated it out to its own command to encourage this best practice and help us focus on our mission. The second mistake I want to talk about is related to the importance of fulfilling the expectations that you set. As you now know, Crane claims to manage a namespace for you, and it's always been that way. However, our pruning was originally based on a whitelist, which meant that we weren't actually pruning a bunch of the less common uh, namespace resource types. This meant that whenever we adopted more kinds internally, we would go through these really painful audits to make sure it was safe to add a kind to our whitelist that hadn't been there for years. We would also have to then post messages in our change log warning company, other companies that they had to do the same. And that, frankly, really sucks. When we decided to go with the whitelist approach at the beginning, we thought we were being safe. We thought we were erring on the safe side by just deciding to delete less things. That sounds safe, right? But in fact, in a lot of ways, it was more dangerous because it defied the, de the developer expectations that we were setting and it allowed resources to be leaked. Dan? So, there are mistakes and they're just hard <laughs> problems, things that I'm sure you've all experienced. So, the first one I talk about is timeouts. So, in our restart demo, we saw a timeout. And that one was obviously the user's fault. But there's a lot of situations where it won't be. Um, if your container builder system builds large images, and then you have a node that has to download multiple large images at the same time, you're gonna have write contention, and that's gonna be slow. Maybe pod startup is gated by connecting to a slow external resource. Maybe you have cluster issues. 
Who knows? But inevitably, developers will hit res uh, timeouts. So the first time this happens, developers are like, oh, this is different. Let's investigate. Let's power up the logging system, the portal system. Let's get to the bottom of what's going on. And by the time they figure it out, Kubernetes' eventual convergence has converged. They have a successful deploy. They're like, oh, well, that was annoying. They retry the deployment. It's item potent. It succeeds success. Somewhere around four or five times investigating, they get upset. They stop trying to investigate, and they just mash retry. I've seen people hit that button like six times. It's shocking. Um, but this was our fault. It wasn't theirs, right? Like, we didn't give them no way to know, like, oh, this timed out and it was slow versus there's a failure. So we added some nice icons to our um, CD system. We always had the, you know, green, everything's good. But initially, the red X meant timed out or failed. And we said, OK, let's add one more. And we did that with this uh, nice black clock. So now, red X means investigate now, something's wrong. The clock means, OK, we wouldn't, we'd like you to investigate, but if you mash retry, we'll look the other way. Um, we did this with the error codes. Uh, by default, success is 0, 1 is failure. And then we had to find an error code for timeout. And there's no consensus on this. Like, we looked at a bunch of tools, and we picked 70, but I'm sure everyone has their own opinion about what error code timeout should have been. The other tricky problem is actually with kubectl apply. Um, so if you haven't seen it before, there's this last applied configuration annotation. And it only exists on the server, right? It's not in your resources. And so for developers, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, so it looks like this. Um, the, it's a JSON blob is the value of this. And it's essentially the last thing you try to apply. But this doesn't, you know, like, OK, this is fine. It's nice to know what that is. But it gets used in some interesting ways. Uh, the first is pruning. If that annotation is available on a resource, it's considered eligible for pruning. So this is exactly what you want, though, right? You're like, you deleted the thing from the file. It used to be on the cluster. You deployed. It got pruned. Success. But during incidents, well, that's when everything goes out the window, right? Humans start applying things and forget to check them into repositories. They start editing. Things go wrong. And you don't notice until your next deploy when then you accidentally prune something you really wish you hadn't, and then you're back in that first incident from a day ago. Uh, the other fun one is the three-way merge. So I think my mental model when I started with Kubernetes was there's live state on the cluster, and there's this thing here, and kubectl apply patches the live state, and we're all happy. But that's actually not the real model. Uh, there's the three-way merge that I was mentioning. So essentially, Kubernetes considers ownership of various fields based on those uh, values. So where does this happen? Well, we start all of our applications with a static count of replicas, right? When you're first getting going, adding auto-scaling is just one more complexity you don't need. But eventually, you get big, and you need to control costs. You need to make sure you scale up in the middle of the night. You don't page an operator. And you start adding uh, HPAs. And these things are fantastic. I think we all love them. But you need to remove the static replica count from your deployment, uh, from NFS, so that when you deploy, you don't reset to some random number and then have to wait for the HPA to kick back in. And so if your mental model is, well, I just delete that line, I do a patch, and because it's a patch, everything's fine, you totally miss the fact that the three-way merge says, oh, no, 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 you used to own that field, and now you don't, so you want the default, and the default's one. And yeah, then you get some temporary service outages until the HPA kicks you back up. So uh, the really exciting news is in 1.16, server-side apply went to beta, and we're hoping that we stop stumbling into this face first in the near future. So, from hard problems, on to tips. So these are some things that, we're, that we did that we're really happy with. First of all, uh, we were very happy with our decision to use Ruby, and we would use it again if we started from scratch today. Building tooling for Kubernetes doesn't mean you need to write and go. Another thing that has been working well for us is the realization that there are a lot of transient errors in systems like these, and most of the time, they're not worth bringing to the attention of developers. There are a lot of places in our code where we're able to ignore errors we get back from the API server and just try again later, notably in the next polling cycle. Another pattern that we really like is using annotations directly on re resources as a mechanism for letting developers communicate resource-specific settings to us. We actually saw one of these in the demos. When Danny showed you the annotation that you can add to your deployments to tell our uh, crane restart command to target those ones by default. Another tip on the theme of customization is about logging. Since our default output is very developer focused, we want to keep it simple and clear. This means that when we want to use output to debug crane itself, our default output, pretty useless. So to address this, we use an environment variable to enable debug, debug level logging, and that gives us all kinds of extra information, including about all the API calls we're making. 
My final tip is that if you're running a open source Kubernetes tool, definitely consider making an official supported versions list and setting up a CI cluster for each one of those versions. Our test suite does dozens and dozens of deploys to each of our supported versions, and I can't tell you how many bugs that has caught and how much reassurance that has provided us. So, to wrap up, Crane is our developer-centric deploy tooling. It's highly scalable. We have namespaces with thousands of pods, hundreds of services, and hundreds of deployments. If you're saying, ah, we need something bigger than that, let us know. We want a new challenge. Uh, it's open source. If you found this exciting, we'd love to have you contribute. We'd love to have you use it. If you found this really exciting, we're hiring. You can contribute from the inside. And with that, uh, we're easy to find. We're on GitHub at Shopify slash Crane. We're in the Kubernetes Slack channel as Crane. Uh, and we have a ton of developers, and this is all I could fit on a slide. So I want to thank them and all the rest of you, uh, as well as Ben here for coming up with Crane as our new name. And with that, I'd love to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, not yet.